Hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, OLS Cohort 7, Week 9. This week, we're talking open leadership in academia, industry, and beyond. Um, my name is Patricia. I'm one of the resident fellows at OLS, and I'm your host for this uh, cohort call. And co-facilitating with me is uh, the wonderful Cassie, who will do some magic on breakout rooms and um, also introduce some of the speakers. So uh, during this week's cohort call, we um, will discuss uh, open leadership and what it can look like, and also um, give yourself uh, some time and opportunity to reflect on career goals uh, and career paths. Just as a reminder, um, Open Life Science has a code of conduct and community participation guidelines. Um, you can read them in detail following the link that's in the etherpad. Um, in short, uh, be kind to each other and be respectful. If you see any behavior that you feel is unacceptable and uh, doesn't follow the code of conduct, um, report it to one of the directors or uh, path the um, community, the cohort coordinator. Don't know what her official job title is. We, uh, we always get that wrong. Um, email is like first name. So that is uh, Berenice, Mavika, Emmy, or Yo for any of the directors um, at openlifesite.org. Um, we have the auto transcript running. If you want that, you can either click the link in the etherpad or uh, in your Zoom. Um, we have three wonderful speakers in this um, cohort call. We'll hear from Gris, Anshu, and pra Pragya. Um, apologies if I've butchered names already. I've uh, already not attempted last name, so um, please correct me later on. Um, and we also have, uh, in addition to being able to um, ask questions to our speakers, we have a little breakout activity later on. So um, for that, um, folks, please add a W if you want to uh, end up in a written um, breakout room or an S if you want to be uh, in a spoken um, session and discuss there. I do think that's everything for the housekeeping to kick us off. So um, I'll hand over to Cassie to get us started on our speakers. Amazing, thank you. So to start off, uh, we're gonna have Chris, who's going to talk us through um, social enterprise. So I'll hand it over to Chris so that they can introduce themselves. Thanks, Cassie. I always have double mute, like once in Zoom and once on my audio device. Um, so hey, everyone, I'm Chris Hackrink. I'm a researcher by training. I I live in Berlin now, but I'm Dutch by origin, and I've been working on open science for over a decade, which makes me feel very old when I say that. Uh, but on the other hand, it also gives me the opportunity to be at, uh, at meetings like this and to, I guess, share some of my experiences in terms of, you know, running projects and what it means also to go beyond just um, having an idea and then subsequently trying to really build that out like open life science has done. I think it's been tremendous to see that really grow from an idea into such a such a big community. Uh, so in that sense, you're already getting a lot of uh, a lot of experience just by by being in this space. And so I back in 2017, I participated in the Mozilla Open Leaders program, which was really the start for my uh, trajectory in uh, what you could call social enterprise. And so it's been over six years then. I started with uh, with, with the Liberate Science Project, uh, completely different contents, but uh, the same name. And the idea there was really also to have a 
name that goes beyond just the individual, to have a project that goes beyond any single person. And I think if we think about social enterprises or social projects or you know anything that you are probably also working on throughout the, the OLS cohort, it's this question of, you know, how does this project become more than just you as an individual working on it? And then also the question, how do you want to work on it and how do you want other people to work on it? Because it's not a given, uh, you know, here also in the Open Life Science cohort, but also in the Open Mozilla Open Leaders cohort, it was very much a culture of sharing, of open innovation, of you know being respectful towards each other, considerate, and really trying to build something else. And I think in that sense, when when I got this invitation to talk a bit about these uh, social enterprises, I think there is really the difference. It's you know we can think about businesses, but how how would these these values that you're talking about in the cohort, these open values, how do they translate into scaling, growing, cultivating a project beyond just the idea you have and then really getting other people on board and to make sure that 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 culture is resilient also to conflict, to uh, struggles uh, and, and everything. So today I want to sort of like I, I, I always think in visuals. Uh, so I'm going to I started off with the Mozilla Open Leaders bit and want to sort of go towards incorporating the project, uh, which is really the, the meat of, um, of what I want to talk about. And then at the very end, sort of bring it all back together again and share a bit about how we're trying to do uh, a responsible enterprise in liberate science and where we want to take that in the future, because this is also very much an ongoing journey. So first off, I think that with a lot of projects, um, I hear this often when I mentor people is that, uh, you know, a lot of projects, they start out and then at some point a business or an enterprise, a legal entity really becomes a necessity uh, so that, you know, there's a certain amount of liability that you can distance from your personal life, but also in terms of, you know, who's the contact point for uh, legal questions, for financial questions, and it opens up this this idea of, well, you need a legal person, not a natural person, which is a human, uh, but a legal person is just a construct to really be able to receive funding, to receive uh, whatever you need to make your project a success. So really to bring this, this, this point home is that if you want your project to become more than something you do or a group of people do, then you need uh, you need this legal entity to be able to make it a success. And if you don't have an institution housing you, that's something to start thinking about at a very early uh, early point. Of course, it's not to discourage you from starting up a project, but it's sort of to keep that in mind. And so, what does it mean to run a, a project, an organization, according to those open principles that you're learning about here? but also in terms of uh, you know, your own perspectives on it. What does it mean to have a code of conduct for an organization? What does it mean to be inclusive in an organization when there are ultimately very few examples out there that really do it completely in line with the values that, that you might have? So you're learning to run an open project, but, but in essence, running an open organization, whether that's a profit, for-profit based project or a non-profit based project, in essence, bringing those open values into an organization makes it a social enterprise. There's not a certain bar that you need to hit. Uh, you know, you need to have a certain social impact on this many communities. That means it becomes a social enterprise, but you have to really think about, well, what does, what does this social enterprise mean? for you, for your project, and what is the impact that you want to have? And so really this question of what does it mean to run an open organization? And I think that when, when we look at it, you might take a moment throughout this cohort to also think about, well, are there organizations that do that in a way that inspire you, but also vice versa in a way that you would like to see uh, move better? I know organizations that have inspired me because they share their finance statements openly. And I think that's that's a very interesting perspective because you know what does it mean to bring this openness to not just how you create your code, 
but also in how you do your bookkeeping, for example, because the, and of course, with the limitation that it needs to be privacy sensitive. And what happened for me was at some point that I, I got very, I, I was very lucky to receive funding and there was a certain requirement to, to, to then incorporate the, the project Liberate Science into a entity. So for me, part of the challenge was to say, okay, what does it mean to run a for-profit uh, entity within the open space? Uh, how can we make a, a generative uh, business that really contributes to the community and is based on these open values. And what does that mean? So back in 2019, uh, I received that funding. I wanted to set up first a worker cooperative here in Germany, because the idea being that then you share that responsibility, you share the decision making with the entire group of people working on the project. That is surprisingly hard because not many people do this. So there's already this friction between, you know, what, what's the well-trodden path and what, what isn't uh, in terms of how do you want to set up your project. I, we ended up setting up a regular limited liability company also because you have to put everything in writing at the very start. And very often uh, when, we, when we are at these projects, we don't yet know the rules and the the, the how we want to set up these projects because we're s figuring it out as we go along. So what we ended up doing, we, we registered a regular company, but we said, okay, you know, let's figure out what what does it mean to be a social enterprise, to be a responsible business. And so then over time, you know, there's a lot of lessons you need to learn if you're starting a project and you want to want to really build that out in a social enterprise, you have to really reflect on, are you okay with becoming a manager, somebody who's managing other people to do their tasks and not that you are, you know, sitting coding the whole time, but also the, uh, the joy of compounding skill sets, I always say, because you're going to have to become apt in uh, reading legal documents uh, and to do bookkeeping and to become familiar with your, your local finance laws. So you really become a generalist through that. And I think that's, that's a really good thing as well, it provides you with a unique perspective on the space. But you also have to start learning around communications because you know, I always say, if you communicate something once, you know, it, nobody will remember. And uh, it, it, it usually people only start hearing something when you've said it like eight times, especially within within a project. So what what this means is if you want to set up the uh, social enterprise, it also means you need to become very clear in what is your vision, what is the strategy and to make it so obvious that people almost start saying it for you so uh, that you be, you repeat these things so frequently that other people, you know, can almost dream of what your vision, what your strategy is, the people you're working with. And those are really important points where you also start thinking about, well, how do you, how do you articulate these visions, these strategies, and how do you involve people? And I think that's really also where the, the vision for uh, Liberate Science really comes in. Because what we do is, you know, we, we are a business, but our, the people we work for or with is primarily researchers. And we said, well, we noticed for quite a while that they weren't as involved in our decisions as we wanted them to be. So we said, okay, how can we bring them into that space, into the decision making process so that we can actually, uh, actually hear their needs and do something with them? So we said, okay, let's set up this, these assemblies. We've been doing these for almost two and a half years now. We've had 10 general assemblies where, you know, people from the project join, people from uh, the researcher community join, and they then really get to this, there's this space where people can exchange, hey, we think this is going well, this isn't going all too well, we should improve this, this is high priority for us. And then there can be proposals from the community to, make the project something else because i think ultimately this is a big part of a social enterprise is you you have an idea you start a project and then after the initiation so to speak it becomes a community thing so it because it takes on a journey of its own which means that you have to be able to sort of take a step back and to create the structures for you to be able to do so 
So we've been around for almost four years and we're definitely still on that journey, but think about what does it mean for succession? How can you make yourself redundant in a project? If the project is only successful because you're doing everything, then you have to ask this question, is the project really successful? Because if something happens to you, if you need to take a few weeks off for, you know, no reason whatsoever, just because, you know, you want to take a few weeks off, the project should be able to continue running with the same values that you want the project to run with. So really thinking about what does it mean to structure, to institutionalize open values into the project that you're trying to create. That's really something that I'm continuously also trying to figure out, but it's good to have these conversations because you can't Google this. Uh, you can Google a lot, but this is something which is really a community driven project where you have to figure out, well, what are the values that we have and how do the values change because society is changing, our lives are changing, our, the, the, the community demographics are changing. So. I think in that sense, I, I think I've been already already been talking for around my allotted time. So I'm going to leave it at that. But I think the, the main part here really being is what does it mean to institutionalize your idea of open into the project that you're running? Amazing. Thanks, Chris. There was so much there. Um, I'm sure everybody will get something from that. Um, round of applause, virtual and in person. Um, so there's one question so far um, from Patricia. So do you ever think about going back in to regular academia? So it's been five years since I left. And to be honest, uh, no, because I still work with academics and I've, I was already frustrated when I left. And I'm even more frustrated now because it's like, you you want to do an hour long meeting and not have an agenda. I don't have time for that. It's like, we can have an hour long meeting if there's an agenda and there's like a clear purpose. And then when the when the meeting is there, there's just a lot of chit chat. And I go like, I, 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 ha I sort of start chairing the meeting simply because I feel like it's, it's too unstructured and uh, also very, very, um, very optimistic for some reason like very often it's oh yeah we'll you know we'll work th with this community and they'll distribute our results I go like but you don't even have any connections there oh we'll figure it out I go like no you won't so in that sense uh i i really don't miss it i'm very selective about it and uh, yeah it's been a good if it, even if you want to stay in academia i would advise you to go out for a bit just to see what else is there because yeah it's um it's been a it's been a ride in that sense yeah the lack of structure it seems like such a structured from the outside looking in but it, it's yeah there's no structure at all <laughs> um wonderful does anybody else have any questions if not always feel free to reach out if something comes up at a later time I don't have a question, Chris, but I just wanted to say a way to go. It was really inspiring. Thank you very much, Andrew. Amazing. So thank you, Chris. Um, I'll hand it back over to Patricia. Thank you, Cassie, and thank you, Chris. Um, that was like a nice overview of, uh, you know, moving from academia into something else. Um, Next up, we have a talk about, you know, she said there are a few bad things about academia and doesn't suit everyone, but you still can, you know, do great leadership within academia. And uh, our next speaker, Anju, will um, talk us how that, through how that could look like. Anju, over to you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, maybe I can first start sharing my screen and then I can talk. So, I hope my slides are visible. Looks perfect. Thank All you. All right. So as opposed to what Chris did, this is a very academic presentation. So thanks, the, thanks to the OLS team for having me today. 
So what I tried to do in today's uh, presentation is to uh, do a few uh, things. So just before I do that, I actually working at the Institute of Microbial Technology in India. I'm also an associate professor with ACSAR. I teach data science applications to IIT students, and I also actually have a lab in and in some in France. So uh, I've been practicing, as Chris was saying, open science and open science projects for past 15 years. And this is a very, very interesting journey because this always, you know, there are a lot of questions on your uh, dashboard. And uh, one of the questions is what motivates you to come to lab every day? I think what, what, what motivates me to come to work every day is to meeting new people and working on projects which are extremely difficult. So that's a very, very big motivation for me. And I don't think that more, that motivation can go away at any point in time, because when you do crowdsourcing, when you do open science projects, you end up meeting new people, you end up learning, and it never gets boring. So it's a very exciting uh, way to operate. So the track I'm speaking today is an academic leadership. So what I have done is I briefly covered three points today. First is an example from my personal journey in terms of how collective wisdom can work towards global good. I'll make some recommendations on open science ethics and standards, and then uh, some open challenges for the next generation leaders in academia, and what are the opportunities that lies ahead. Because that's very, very important for the younger generation to understand that there are many, many unsolved problems that we still are struggling with. So uh, picking up the first one, uh, how do you actually do collective wisdom to solve a global problem? So one of the projects that I, this is my actually one of the first uh, big project that I did with open science was to utilize social networks to generate a biological network for mycobacterium tuberculosis. Now, MTB is a causative agent for tuberculosis and the catch is TB, oh, we all know is an infectious disease. It mostly affects lungs, it best spreads through air. And uh, since we know COVID-19, to put in that context, it is the second leading infectious killer after COVID-19, which means before the pandemic, this was the major killer on the earth. It is present in all countries and affects all age groups. And now the drug resistant forms of TB are extremely difficult to treat. So what we intend to do was, we wanted to generate a biological network of MTB, which was only possible if we could have mined that data from the future. So that was the first uh, you know, bottleneck. And the second was to basically utilize this network to identify targets which can be used to develop new antibiotics. Now, uh, some of you might not be aware of this uh, elephant story. So I'm just sharing that with you. So what you see here is an elephant and there are six blind men trying to make sense of it. And if you really see, none of them is saying it's an elephant, right? They're not able to comprehend the organism because they are blind. They, what, what they feel, what they touch is what their perception is. If I translate the same problem into the big data scenario today, we are doing the same thing. We believe protein X is important. We believe medicine Y will not work or the synergy is important, but we are like blind men trying to you know, understand the organism, the problem in a very, very narrow sense. And that is why we thought that network biology or you know having a holistic view of the organism is the most logical way of understanding what's, what goes on in there. And what was the objective? The objective was very simple. If, say, for example, I wanted to utilize, uh, you know, uh, basically bring stand still an entire city by blocking only a few roads. If I have the network or basically the map of the city, I can apply a lot of algorithms, identify choke point in the city, and I can bring an entire city to a standstill. So you don't really have to go and block every road. There will be certain routes which are very critical. And if we identify that, it, it can actually allow us to block the system. And what we are wanting to block in our project was MTV, right? So we wanted to have a Google equivalent map of uh, MTV. And the map here is nothing but protein protein functional network. And this data was lying in literature. So we did an open call. A lot of uh, participants throughout the world, more than a thousand people joined us in mining this literature and we created the most comprehensive protein-protein interaction and metabolic map for MTP. And then we further, you know, this is how the network looked like. So if I just extend 5% of the mesh that you, the, net, the, the hair ball that you see on the right is what it looks like. So it was a pretty intense network and we also utilized it to generate what we wanted to have. We were wanting to identify proteins which are absolutely crucial for microbacteria to survive. So this actually allowed us to contribute in a very, very strong scientific sense to increase our understanding of a very, very bedded pathogen. When this was done, and basically following all concepts of 
open science and open science principles. It caught the attention of the world and a lot of people wrote about this project saying we could package 300 man years into four months and this is the way of doing big science and systems biology and so on and so forth. But at the core, at the heart of this project was that this was done in an open science concept. Let everybody participate and try and solve a global problem. What did we learn from this project? This is very important. So this is critical for all the open, uh, you know, the OLS team. It is not a teacher teaching you. It's like self-learning in groups. This is what open science is about. We have to teach each other. And that is the only way we'll be able to solve anything which is tricky. The second learning is there have to be rules. Open science does not mean that there is flexibility. If you remember the way we used to play our childhood games, even those games had rules for us to enjoy them properly, right? So you one should not think that if it is open science, it is, you know, it can be chaotic. It has to, if it has to be fun, healthy, and enjoyable, it, there have to be rules, and one should know the rules, which I'll tell you in a little while. And some of the insights we got from our open science project connected to decode was there were several things that one has to account for. Like, say, for example, you do a lot of mentorship projects. We need to have SOPs for each project. Did, if these projects require extensive training and discussions. We need to have communities that are talking to each other. There has to be a clear roadmap of delivery with strict timelines and obviously collaborative platforms where people can actually put on their data in a very, very reasonable fashion. Now, this is, I just went through very, very quickly through this, not telling you any biology of NTV, but the take home message is that every time that I've done several crowdsourcing projects, this is the timeline of that, been doing this for a very long time. And every project allows me to learn something new because not the same principle apply every time you design a project. Depending on what the outcomes are, your team, the knowledge base of the team, the platforms, every, everything changes. And that is why when you practice open science, there are certain criteria that one has to follow. And I think not just open science, even if people are not doing open science, they should still do this, is that one should have knowledge of science ethics, first of all. And when I say science ethics, the concepts of plagiarism, authorship, credit sharing has to be very, very, uh, it's very cr critical, actually. And one of the places where we are not really sure of the ethics are generating AI platforms like ChatGPT. Should we use it as a tool? Should we use it as an assistant? So it should be a co-author. There is a lot of question marks here. No clarity on these uh, platforms going forward. But then one has to also be aware of open access platforms. One should eliminate citation bias and AI can help and use reproducible workflows and protocols. Reproducibility in science is key. And I think open science really has the power to bring reproducibility in science. There are a lot of issues when I am talking of eliminating citation bias. People who have uh, authority, by high authority gets more citation. It's like a self-feeding loop. The impact factor of the journal, then a lot of self-citations. These are issues as a community, we can address it. And then there are a lot of platforms like protocols, IOD, Diverse, Galaxy, Fix, Shares, and Auto. The community should be aware of these platforms. And that is why I am sharing them here for the benefit of the newcomers in the OLS community. I'm pretty sure the OLS community is aware of this. Now, uh, the catch is a lot of raw data allows us to really do open science in its soul and essence. And a lot of journals, thankfully, are asking for data sharing in a raw format so that it can be verified. But at the end of the day, what I think is still missing is the standard metadata definition. This is something which most people still don't understand. And this is a major problem when it comes to convergence. Convergence of data will not happen. And believe me, we are living in an era of biology where biology is like quantitative science. It is not more a qualitative science. You know? So we need to have these standards. And I would like to point to the newcomers in the community to the standards for data sharing, like the fair sharing sharing.org. And it's not just available for biology. It is available for all domains of science. Now, having said this, you know, the, it is also important to document your experiments day to day in the most uh, you know, reasonable manner. So one should follow good documentation practices. And believe me, you don't need training for that. When Graham Bell uh, made a discovery, this is how he documented his results ages ago, right? So what it needs is the right mindset and researcher's mindset to document data in the most reasonable fashion for reproducible science. And today our life is made easy. We can do reproducible science because there are electronic lab notebooks that allow you to document it well. So given that a lot of things, see, I teach ethics at my institute and uh, I also teach electronic lab notebooks and other things. So I know a lot of people are not aware of these principles. They're not aware of these platforms. 
So a recommendation to OLS is that we can have a MOOC for open science. And these are custom MOOCs for different science domains because physicists, biologists, and chemists don't have the same requirements. So this is a very, very important contribution that we as a community can make. We need to inform about open science policies around the world because they are not same. There has to be an update on science public and publication ethics because it is changing. It is constantly changing every year. And if you look at a recent uh, uh, recommendation on open science by UNESCO, they actually came up with a full recommendation. And the reason why they're recommending it is because the definition of open science itself is not something that all of us use in a very coherent fashion. All of us have a different perception of what open science actually means. And this convergence is very, very important in terms for us to follow at least similar protocols, similar, you know, we can help each other better in terms of when we start speaking the same language, right? Now, this brings me to uh, the last part of my talk. So I covered my personal example of what I did with crowdsourcing and open science. I also covered a few guidelines or recommendations in terms of what we can really do going forward. The challenge today, and I think the challenge in academia is very well clear. The evolution of academia was in early 90s, it was only published. If you observe something and you want to share it with the scientific community, you write a paper. And then it became 20 years ago, publish or perish. And then it became either you publish in high impact journals or you don't. Study. And now it is high impact journals frequently. So academic setup is becoming more of a publication scenario, not so much of discovery, which is a very worrisome scenario. It is not something which is doing any good. And the reason why I say this is for a very simple reason that open science is thoroughly exploited by predatory journals. Now, this is something that we as a community will have to stop because this is impacting the culture and scientific ethics. It is impacting the way we are doing science. There is a lot of accreditation pressure on universities, and this is promoting corruption in open science. And this has to stop because, you know, I, even I, as of today, I'm very confused about what is what is predatory, what is not predatory. Believe me, there is no single platform where I can really verify a journal being of predatory nature or not. It's a big mess. And I find it very difficult to segregate authentic scientific literature from something that I'm not supposed to follow. So it is becoming a bigger, it's a, it's a really big problem, believe me. I struggle with it every day because most of my lab works to publish publicly available data sets. So we can make wrong discoveries depending on what is already published. So it's a, it's a big mess. So a recommendation again would be, we need to increase champions or ambassadors of open science. So if we can a generate network of OS implementers across institutes, like the way OLS is doing, if we can have several OLS chapters across different institutes, it will ensure it is sustainable. And that, is, that I think is missing in most of the way uh, we are uh, funding and you know implementing projects. We should have mobility grants for training programs. We should train people as much as possible on you know, the detailed guidelines because this is not something that you can do over a half an hour period. People should actually practice open science as a project. They should work with people who have been doing it properly. Talk of uh, you know, the metadata architecture, talk of how these are, you know, the convergence of uh, data sets. So this is, this is very, very important. And for that, I think the incentivization will, might help. We should reward open science practice practitioners. We should reward people who are doing good engagement with the scientific community at large. And these are very non-traditional ways of looking at science. Now, we all know that most journals, apart from bibliometrics, also have alt metrics. But still, alt metrics is not in focus when you are uh, assessing the impact of science and engagement. It is still your citation index, right? Which I think is a point for debate. But I still believe that alt metrics should also be uh, given a decent amount of focus when it, go, when it comes to uh, you know, an engage, uh, assessing the impact of science. There are other open challenges, which I think most of us are aware of, so I'll not spend too much time here. Just three main messages. One, we need scalable applications, which allow us to do open science in a very, very lucid manner, because not everybody has an IT background. We need to make it easy for people to you know, get onboarded. We need to have platforms to share social engineering. It is a very custom made thing as of now. I've done several projects every time, you know, we have to think of a new way of doing it. And of course, as I said earlier, we need to use standards. I'd like to close here and just point you to my Twitter pinned tweet. tweet. It is, I tweeted on November 18th, 2014, and it's still my pinned tweet is. And the reason why I'm writing that is because this worries me every single day. Curtailed data access, 
and fear of publish or perish. You know, this is leading to a lot of problems in science because we are actually doing a lot of pseudo discoveries and promoting it. So we are feeding into that cycle even more, right? So this is a message that I actually, uh, you know, strongly believe in and we need to find a solution as a team. Uh, one thing that I also want to convey to some of the young uh, members in the group is that age does not define academic excellence. Please don't believe that somebody who's senior enough would be a good academician and somebody who is a child is not a good acad academician. Internet has changed the way we learn. So it's no more that a, a kid is going to school or have access to XYZ professors is only going to learn. Kids are now learning. So depending on their passion and interest, they are actually doing science, which sometimes is difficult to be done by my PhD students. So these are basically two young school kids who came to do research in my lab. They both published with, uh, with me when they were still doing their school. And these are some of my highly cited research articles in my career. And these guys went on to, you know, now both of them are doing, one of them is doing PhD at York University in UK. The other one is doing PhD at Caltech. So these children are really good when they were 17, 18 years of age. Nobody took them seriously. I think we need to change that mindset. When access to knowledge is there, like open now, this is again the power of open sciences. There is a lot of content which is available out there. The students are making use of it and learning. And I think that is what makes it very, very interesting. Now, I would like to close here. But if you guys think I can take one and a half more minutes, if the time permits, I would like to show everybody uh, a teaser uh, of a video game that my lab made. And the reason I wanted to show you that is because I work in the domain of antimicrobial resistance. And I strongly believe that apart from making hardcore scientific discoveries, it is important that a wider scientific, you know, the wider audience, which are our citizens, should be aware of the problem of AMR. And the reason why uh, a game was developed because I wanted to target an impressionable age group, 11 year old to like 15, 16 year old. And that is why I thought get developing a game was a best scenario rather than you know teaching them some more. So now this video game, I'm just not going to play the video game. I'm just going to show you a teaser. It is one minute uh, teaser. So I hope you'll be able to uh, hear it. So here it goes. Are you getting the music? Ah, yeah, okay. all good. Because Chris said music was not there. So Chris, maybe you can try one more time. Yeah, I'll just replay it. So, so the catch is now WHO has endorsed this game and they want us to customize it for first year medical students. So we are doing and working on that right now. We also became one of the top five games in the world in the international education games competition. So that was a very good thing. I try and play this game to the wider community because the message is use antibiotics wisely and it applies to all of us. 
So that is why I took this as an opportunity to see that this message gets across because we are actually, we don't want to live another pandemic where the back, where a bacterial pathogen can be a problem because it, developing a vaccine or a drug against a bacteria is going to be much more harder than it is for a virus. So we need to, and it's already a silent pandemic. So we need to understand and realize that it's, you know, we are running late uh, in addressing this global issue. And that is the reason why, apart from doing the regular scientific projects that we do, we try and do this, you know, diversify in different ways. And uh, this is basically to tell you, this is my institute here, Institute of Microbial Technology. And the reason I'm showing this is because we rank among top four institutes in the world to, uh, in terms of contribution of open access databases in biological sciences. And this is an assessment done uh, by the database comments. So this is a contribution. So my institute aligns well with the, uh, you know, the concept of open science, and we have been doing it for the past 30 years. And with that, I would like to again thank the OLS team. These are my coordinates for anybody who would like to get in touch with me. And I would like to thank all the funding agencies uh, who have financed my lab for all these years. So thank you, and I will be very happy to take questions. Wow, that was that was a lot of good information in a, a lot of information. Uh, in a in in that talk. Like, thank you so much, um, uh, people. Please to put questions in in the doc and ask questions. This is your opportunity to um, you know ask really interesting folks. Um, and I, I have to say, like, I did a little happy dance when you talked about metadata. I'm a librarian by training. And usually, like, you know, we're banging on about this and no one else wants to talk about metadata. So if there's someone else um, preaching metadata and it's not a librarian, that makes my day. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I, are there any questions? Does anyone want to unmute and ask? that I knew it was a uh, it was a lot of things packaged in 10 12 minutes uh, but that for that same reason I have shared the link to my slides just in case somebody would like to revisit and talk to me more I just wanted to make sure that you know it's not that uh, every time I do an open science project I'm doing it for quite some time now you know it's kind of a revision you just cannot repeat what you did last time so so that's that's the that's the fun part of it. It's the challenge part of it, and I think that is the motivation part of it as well. Yeah, great, Pragya. I see your hand up. Uh, feel free to ask. Yeah, hi, Anshu. hi, Anshu. That was a fantastic presentation. I have to admit, and I'm like really uh, taken in by the game thing uh, that uh, that you showed. Uh, I am actually kind of curious, like a lot of people have been using uh, such virtual games, uh, not just only to disseminate information, but also for citizen science projects. So is it something that you are currently looking into or do you think this game has the potential to be expanded in some ways to address some of those questions as well, where you can actually include citizen science in the equation? Right, so I, I'm glad, uh, Pragya, you asked that question. Uh, one thing that I have not shown you, which we are actually doing a part of the game is, see, right now what happens is, in like my currently the game has nine levels, okay? So it's not a single level game. So every level in the game as you progress talks about one concept of AMR. Now, when we are discussing that in a classroom setting with school children and the game at the front of, when you play the game, it is all gaming. But when you look at the scores, you know, the resistance bar, all of that at the back of it are scientific equations, which this is how it you know, actually happens scientifically. But we don't want to bore the uh, player with all that, all that data, all that information. But all the gaming elements, the way they operate mathematically are driven by science. And that's hardcore science that goes behind it. Now, one of the challenges we had is how do we scale this up? Like we cannot go to every school in the world. It's not possible. So what we are doing is we are now building a conversational AI, a chatbot inside the game. And we also wanted a lot of clinicians. If we want to actually use it to understand how antibiotics are being used in a citizen science perspective, the chatbot can generate that data apart from the users playing the game. 
So this is something, this is the component that where we are bringing in the citizen science component of it, really gathering the essence of how people are really using antibiotics through the gaming platform. So hopefully in next few months, the chatbot will be a part of the gaming platform. See, one of these things are very tricky because we are doing chat bar, chatbot in Rasa. This is done in Unity 3D. So if you really look at the technologies, they're extremely uh, different. So yeah, so we are trying to basically find APIs and that we can explore in terms of citizen science projects. Yeah, as I told you, I'm very open to this because I like working with new people. So I'll be very excited to, to work with you and anybody else. So. Sounds wonderful. Amazing. Thank you for that, Andrew. Um, Thank you. Uh, if there are more questions, feel free to put them in the etherpad or um, like, you know, Andrew left contact details so you could get in touch afterwards if you wanted. Um, I, but with that, I hand back to Cassie so we get on to our last speaker in the session. Amazing. Thank you. Um, so next, we're going to talk a bit about a um, side of research that's often forgotten about, um, policymakers, um, and a very important part of research, uh, funders and meta-researchers. So I will hand it over to Pragya, and you can introduce yourself to the group and tell us all the wonderful information you have to tell us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kathy. Um, Thank you to the OLS team for inviting me uh, today for, you know, to be part of this uh, wonderful conversa conversation. And uh, I actually have to admit, uh, it will be very difficult going after Anshu's presentation. And uh, <laughs> I mean, to say she has covered so much of things already, but I will actually try to keep it uh, very focused uh, to the policy space or the work that we have been doing. Um, so I do not have a presentation and I will try to keep it very short because I would be happy to have like more interactive sessions later on if people are actually interested in uh, going about this, uh, you know, ask any questions. So a very, uh, firstly, a very quick introduction to what I do and uh, who I am. So my name is Pragya Jove and I did my MSc and PhD at the University of Sheffield, UK in genetics and bioinformatics. So during my PhD, I realized there is a huge gap between what is happening within, uh, within a lab in academic silos and what we actually see uh, outside in the real world. So I, was, I mean to say that work was very interesting, uh, but at some level, I just did not think it was fulfilling. I wanted to see the results of my work in the real world, like having an impact on a regular person, uh, which is a very unrealistic ambition, but uh, this is what I felt, this is how I felt at that point of time. So a uh, quick note that I was working in basic sciences. So for basic sciences to translate into something applicable is actually, a, you know, it takes time. And I just did not think that I was ready to wait for long enough to see that entire transition happening from applied, uh, sorry, basic sciences to applied sciences and then being adopted in the society and everything. I was, you know, sort of feeling a bit impatient that I, if I'm working, I want to see how it's affecting the society. So after some soul searching and exploration, I realized that I loved communicating science to people outside of academia, like to the public, to the industry, to the government. And science policy was a very niche domain, which kind of uh, fulfilled my fantasy that I, you know, that science should be taken out of the labs and to the real world, uh, where it actually makes some differences. And this also required learning to communicate with different stakeholders, uh, particularly policymakers, who are a very, uh, you know, different kind of breed of people. And uh, like, as uh, Cassie had said, they are like very important to what we do because we want research to impact policy and impact the wider society at the end of the day. So 
it is at this around uh, it is about this time when i actually decided that okay i'm going to transition from science to science policy and when i started looking into science policy careers and options like what exactly is happening within this domain it kind of made a lot of sense to me that i should be moving back to india and science policy is at a very nascent stage in in the country and i mean i have to say this because i was very lucky enough to find a position uh, within the government of india's academic think tank one of the academic think tanks which is called department of science and technology center for policy research which is based out of indian institute of science in bangalore and when i joined for this position another nice coincidence that was happening or thing that was uh, happening uh, that government of india was drafting the fifth national science technology and innovation policy and they had kind of laid out uh, all the policy areas where they want to focus the country's resources towards and one of the major conversation was happening around open science so to give you some perspective why i had mentioned that i was working in basic sciences and not just in basic sciences i was working with non model organisms i mean most of the people here know what non model organisms are but just in case these are the organisms that scientific community scientific community does not really like research into because most of the times it kind of boils down to like they are very difficult to study and they usually do not have some direct uh, connection with the human you know something that can impact humans so for example some model organisms could be laboratory mice and guinea pigs i was working on a marine snail named litorina sexatellis so the thing that i am actually talking about this non model organism and everything is because when i was doing my phd things with non model communities are like there are very few people around the world who are actually working on like some one non model organism and these are very uh, small communities and the uh, at least from what i had experienced uh, people are more collaborative than competitive so and not just that like where i was doing my phd in my department the environment uh, was very conducive to openness so you know publishing in open access or putting our codes on github or putting our resources in public repository was actually something that we did not have to think through it was something that we just kind of knew that this is what we need to do it was part of the culture over there and so this is what and plus the fact that the department was very well funded is something that kind of helped which is something that i did not realize it back then like how this entire ecosystem is functioning but at some point uh, i mean what i want to say that it was the entire environment like you see your peers doing it you see like there's a like how, how all the pi's are doing it how everybody is doing it and there is enough support there the sources to you know uh, give us that kind of awareness like okay this is open science and this is you should be putting your things out in the open and uh, then there is also funding to support that and <laughs> the entire uh, environment was like that and which is how it should be because i mean this is this is how science grows incrementally right on the shoulder of the giants and uh, but when i actually was in india and i was part of this entire conversation around open science for this uh, government of india's fifth draft of sti policy i this is when i kind of realized that this is uh, openness within academic research is not by default it is not always the case uh, and there are multiple reasons to it there are multiple layers to it and it also kind of help me see that openness can mean a lot of different things to different people like it could mean there's something different in different geographic contexts uh, it could mean different things for different actors and stakeholders and even within different stem disciplines not just this time if you actually move into humanities and literature even for them like openness within academic research means different things for different people and as anshu had uh, mentioned in her talk uh, till very recently we did not even have a common 
definition for what is open science, what practices uh, are called open science. It's only in 2021 when UNESCO came up with its uh, recommendation framework for open science. They brought together all these different definitions that are there, different practices that are there, and they brought it under the bigger umbrella of open science. And the idea was that, that it should not, like nobody should be excluded from the you know, benefits of open science. No region or uh, no particular discipline or no actor should be excluded. It should be a comprehensive definition. It should be a comprehensive set of practices. So at a global level, everybody should be able to extract as much benefits of open science as possible. So this was the starting point for me. And I wanted to take this conversation forward. Uh, so within open science, when uh, people talk about open science, there is a general tendency, uh, especially within the developing countries and global south, <laughs> uh, that people tend to discuss a lot more about open access. And there are like issues, uh, I mean to say there are reasons behind that because open access is a huge issue because of funding limitations that we face. Like we cannot publish in open access because of APC limitations or general subscriptions sometimes become a problem if, especially if a person is not from like tier one institutions, there are constraints, uh, resource constraints uh, around those things. So I wanted to move away from the open access discussion and move towards like what other practices that are happening within the Indian ecosystem. So I started focusing on open research data, which is, basically any data that underpins scientific research and is made available to every, everybody without any restriction, which I'm sure that uh, most of the people here know. So there are a lot of technical requirements to make research data open, but there are equal amount of cultural reluctance. And I wanted to understand like what is happening within this you know, when it comes to open research data sharing practices from an Indian perspective, like what is happening? Because according to NSF report, we are like the third most publishing country in the world, which basically means that we are generating a lot of data. So what are we doing with that data? And kind, I mean, policies around uh, protecting this kind of data is uh, protecting and conserving this kind of data is also important because there are other studies which actually say that whatever data has been generated, kind, we kind of lose it within eight years. So there was a like, major publication around it. Uh, but I mean, for resource country, constrained countries like India and other developing countries, I mean, it does not make sense to lose this kind of data where you have put already so much resources in you know, generating it, right? So to give you an idea, US, which is the most publishing country in the world, had about 1,050 open data repositories in 2019, which is also comparable to EU, by the way, while India only had 50. So this... A physical location does not actually give you much information, except for the fact that policymakers in some parts of the world were actually thinking ahead. They were more invested in building open research data sharing infrastructure. It, except for that, it does not tell you a lot. So basically, my colleague, Dr. Momita Kole, and I, we actually embarked on this journey to understand the open research data sharing practices within India, like what are, what is happening overall in general. And we interviewed uh, faculties uh, from uh, Indian Institute of Science across different career stages and across different fields. And some of the things that we found were actually kind of intuitive. For example, there is a cultural difference across STEM fields. So in some fields, this practice is more mature. For example, in biological fields, that deal, especially the fields that deal with omics data and big data. But then there are other fields that still need to do some catching up, like chemistry. And even within uh, some niche areas or something, their practices are very different. And even the formats and the amount of data that is required for you know, reuse value or uh, 
those uh, you know repurposing and everything that is different so the blanket statement from any policy maker that you know all the researchers should put all their research data in public repositories could actually be very counterproductive it should be like something which uh, people who are in the discipline the discipline leaders should decide what data should be put out for reusability or reproducibility and then there were also concerns about infrastructure because you know we need better data management facilities for uh, storing that kind of data we need you know better analytics methods to be able to pull that kind of data and yes we also need capacity building for that kind of uh, for data management and obviously i mean we as anshu had also said like we need some sort of uh, awareness among faculties and students and everybody who is actually working at the basic level who are actually supposed to you know deposit their data that how do you do that like how do you record data and how do you keep hold of that metadata so we have covered all of that uh, so but we actually when we are speaking to faculty we felt that there is a gap that needs to be addressed and researchers had also kind of raised their concerns about data governance for example they wanted more flexibility in terms of you know if uh, you know public data repositories are mandated for everybody to put their you know research data into they wanted more flexibility in terms of embargo policies and they wanted more authority over their data and one of the major 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 uh, thing that we actually figured uh, that obviously this kind of data storage practices and everything for a longer term storage requires a lot of effort from the sides of from the side of the researchers so they require some incentivization most of the times this incentivization comes from the journals but in as we said in different fields in different stem fields there is a diversity and there is a diversity in journals as well because in some areas in some fields journals like the top journals of that discipline they do not require that uh, for researchers to uh, submit their data so they require some so there should be some sort of incentivization in that sense because a major cultural reason that researchers are afraid to put their data is basically data is scooping and one of the things that we actually figured is uh, there are there i mean um, people who are working within indian set up will let you know that funding delays are very common and researchers are actually afraid like what if we actually put our data already there but which can be reused for another set of publication or something like that but if that data is scooped by somebody else i mean those were like the kind of very common concerns even though it does not make a lot of sense to us right now but for some people who are actually spending a lot of you know already uh, limited resources in generating that kind of data it becomes a big deal so we kind of figured that it's not just uh, journals and not just our entire environment but even our funding agencies need to step up to bring some inherent changes for such uh, to promote such cultural practices within academic research when we were actually thinking about this and looking in within the indian setup we kind of realized that there are similar sort of fundamental concerns regarding infrastructure capacity building and uh, for you know funding cultures uh, within the entire south asian region and it is not just this when we actually started looking into the literature we kind of realized much like india most of the open science discussion that is happening in our neighboring countries is actually restricted to open access and the awareness level that i mean we have very limited awareness in india on open science practices which is not just limited to india but is actually happening in this entire region so at some point uh, my colleague and i we were actually thinking that how should we go about this how should we address this um what should we do about this and we 
kind of realized that we need to extend this entire conversation beyond India. We need to develop a network where a lot of like-minded people can meet and, uh, you know, they can actually talk about open science practices and they can, you know, raise some voice about uh, open science awareness and try to raise open science awareness in this entire region. And that is when we initiated the project Open Science South Asia Network or OSAD, which is I'm like currently managing this project. So within this project, we have not done any academic study yet, but we did organize multiple events and facilitated dialogues between uh, national science academies from India, pa not Pakistan, due to some science, uh, sorry, due to some diplomat uh, diplomatic reasons, we could not invite Pakistan to the con table, but uh, India, Bangladesh, Nepal, Sri Lanka. So we all, uh, you know, we got the national science academies and all their top voices who are very vocal, verbal about open science in their, specific, in their countries. We got all of them together. We got the Apex s &T government agencies within this region to come on the same table and have a conversation like about what are the overlapping priorities in this region and how we can raise awareness on open science practices and how we can take this forward. Like what is exactly required to come together and challenge, uh, you know, address this. Because we have very similar sort of challenges. <laughs> And when it comes to some patterns, it is basically very similar to, uh, you know, what we do, like what researchers are doing within this region. The only place where we actually saw a tiny bit of difference was basically the open science, open access landscape. So apart from open access landscape, we actually felt that there is a need about developing other kind of open science capacity and developing open science infrastructure, which can be addressed through this network. So we just need to come together, raise awareness and build an environment which is conducive for open science practices. So this was also the idea behind this network to just initiate a regional dialogue on South, uh, you know, within South Asian countries. So we can work towards capacity building and invest in open infrastructures and advocate for policies, uh, you know, nationally and also represent the region at global forums. So we are a fairly new network. I mean, we'll be one year old in July and we have like a tiny bit of success in, you know, just getting some important people and policymakers to come on the table and have a discussion about this. Uh, but we are still far from the goal that we had envisioned initially. So yeah, every day we are like just taking a one step towards uh, openness. So let's see what, ha what happens next, what comes next. Yeah, so I think this is it. Uh, I will end the talk here now and happy to take questions. Amazing, thank, thank you. you so much. So, oh, sorry, yeah. like <laughs> didn't realize it was actually not my turn. Apologies, <laughs> sorry, Cass. Don't worry, we we're both very enthusiastic there. <laughs> Um, I love the conversation around how openness can mean something different to each person, uh, not even by country. Um, so that's, that's a really interesting thought for us all to have uh, moving forward. Um, is there any questions? The etherpad isn't, it's gone on a little refresh for me there for a second. <laughs> There's a comment that um, may like to utilize the experience of how OSDD establish the Open Science Network would be happy to help. I'm guessing that's um, Anshu. Um, perfect. I will hand it back over to Patricia to take it from here. Thank you, Cassie, and sorry for getting too excited and uh, butting in there. And uh, thank you, Pragya. It's like uh, really interesting to shift into, to hear someone shift into policy and um, yeah, actually um, 
figure you know figure out the landscape in in, in India it's like um, it sounds really really like interesting work and um, that you have a network there is like great um we do have a breakout discussion scheduled next but we are a little bit behind schedule and we don't have plenty of people uh, left on the call because quite a few had to drop out at the hour so what I suggest um, that we do instead is in uh, the etherpad in line 180 there's um, a silent reflection exercise um, that has prompts about reflecting about your own work and open leadership um, things that you need to do to feel motivated or stay motivated in what you're doing for a few more years and um, where your, your career might be going. Um, you can enhance this or while you're thinking about it, um, the breakout discussion prompts uh, from line 128 into either pad might help to um, inform what you're putting there but I suggest that uh, we do 10 minutes of um, you know silent reflecting instead of uh, the breakout rooms and then we wrap up from there um, our wonderful speakers feel free to um, join us there but if you have to move on to something else um, we also understand that you're all very busy and we appreciate uh, the time you have spent with us so far and would say thank you for um, joining us. I'll pause the recording and you can all do some written reflections. Thank you all for your wonderful thoughts about, you know, what motivates you at the moment and where you currently are in open leadership and want to go. And um, just, uh, uh, you know, a lookout for what's um, coming up in the next weeks here at OLS. Um, this week is the week where you should meet with your mentor. So if you don't have that in your schedule yet, um, you should go get that in. Um, next week, we ha do have another cohort call, um, part two of our open science garden. So um, more, even more open science inspired uh, talks then. Um, and the week after that, again, you uh, will meet your mentor and have another skill up call uh, uh, this time on open source software. So if you're um, just started coding, that will be a really interesting one for you to attend or catch up with. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us in week nine and see you uh, in the next weeks. <laughs>